there's a freedom there, even though that's strange coming from a really tight environment, but it reminds me of a freedom, the freedom that I felt when I was living in Berlin when the wall came down. You know, we've always thought as China's this copying environment. We're just fools to think that Chinese have got no creative ability. They're, they're just, you know, they're powering ahead with some of their young designers and they're thinking about how China fits in in, in a post-communist world and an international world. And that's where it's interesting, I think. I love working in Beijing and I feel so familiar now with it that it's like going to a second home. In the 70s, there was this sort of advent of these female scientists who came forward. There was a very deliberate employment by Leakey, who was a, a male anthropologist who employed three women, one for orangutans, one for gorillas, and one for chimpanzees. Diane Fossey was the one for gorillas. These women focus on much more emotion, emotional intelligence and emotional areas of, of research. So they were talking about how the mothers were parenting. They gave them names rather than numbers. So the whole, the whole way of looking at, at researching animal behavior completely changed. It was revolutionary and that was my childhood. So I was really engaged with that. And then when I got to Berlin and I was quite overwhelmed by the amount of art I'd been seeing and how different, it was a sort of new advent of conceptualism that was going on and it was quite different than what I'd experienced at art school. So I sort of thought about how I could continue on as an individual amongst this sea of, of people sort of following each other in, in movements. So I thought the only way of doing that was to actually engage with what I was really interested in. This is very hands-off for me, really. I I'm normally totally hands-on, but this is a work that needs to be designed and, and made with someone who knows what they're doing, and Philippe is the, um, the master of that. So I'm involved in the conceptual part of it and in the design stage, and then I'm handing it over to Philippe, and I, I just come in and do bits and pieces. I'm used to sort of modelling things out of clay or wax, you know, this is a very different way of, of building something and it's also designed on computer, which I've never done before. So Philippe has sort of really introduced me to that as a, as a way of um, producing a much larger work. Uh, it's been really interesting, it's been a really great process.
Because of deforestation, there's a whole lot of subspecies of all sorts of animals and flora and fauna that are being discovered because they've been locked away in the depths of forests that have never been sort of accessible before. This monkey's found high up on the Yunnan border, roughly around Tibet, in that sort of high sort of mountainous zones. And it was discovered by villagers telling scientists that they had an ancestor that they were hearing in these high areas when they were going foraging. And they heard this sneezing, so it was a sick ancestor. Because of global warming, all these areas are now melting and the areas were dripping into the nose cavity of these monkeys and it's causing them to sneeze. This is a subspecies called the sneezing snub nose. It was a cute story, but it's a sad story and it's an interesting symbol of global warming. And I think there's this whole thing that's happening globally where a lot of nature is actually becoming urbanised. So urban environments and wildlife are starting to have to engage together to survive, both, both ways. <laughs> it is a big issue over there and it's a big talking point. So it, was, it, was, it definitely resonated, without a doubt. Probably more so there than it would here. <laughs> We're still got our head stuck in the sand here about all this stuff. Yeah, you know, we can look out the window and still see blue sky, so we don't really care. In my downtime after the monkey was put up, I went and did some works that were for a show in Australia and for a private client, which were these large gibbon hands. There's a few unique things about gibbons. One is that they are the only other primate apart from humans that are monogamous, so they partner for life. And in the morning, the male goes off and the females go off separately and they search for food and then they meet. Surprisingly, in January this year, 2017, they discovered in Yunnan again a new subspecies of gibbon. It's called Skywalker gibbon, and it's called Skywalker because this scientist is obsessed with Luke Skywalker. And I love the fact that he's chosen an American hero from popular culture to represent this monkey that he's discovered. I want to do it for Earth Hour next year, 2018. Once again, it'll be about the same scale, 14 metres, on the same building. It was such a great collaboration with the opposite house. It's going to be a male gibbon, and he's going to be close to the rooftop of the opposite house. And he's going to have a soundtrack of that male gibbon voice, vocalisation, and it's going to be calling out over the rooftops of Beijing, looking for love. <laughs> 